Hi, I'm Maria Natastad, and in this video I will do my best to answer a question that I get on the channel a lot, which is, bioinformatics sounds great, but how do I get started with it? What do I do first? Is there a course I can take or something that will just like magically make me a bioinformatician? Um, so first off, I want to say that bioinformatics is really just an extension of biology. It's about how you do biology. So ultimately we're still answering biology questions. We're just doing it with slightly different technologies. Um, sometimes we're doing more high throughput sequencing. Um, we're doing other kinds of experiments that yield a lot of data. And then we need to do some programming or some statistics to deal with that massive amount of data. And that kind of makes it bioinformatics. Um, at least that's how I see it. So bioinformatics can be many different things. And I have a whole video on what is bioinformatics and there's different areas to it. But in this video, I'll share with you some of the things that kind of the series of steps that I would take if I was starting out again as a biology major in college and I wanted to learn bioinformatics because I kind of wanted to get into more of that um, quantitative computer science technical area of biology that is bioinformatics. So the first thing that I would suggest is to learn Python as your first programming language if you don't already know programming. I suggest this because I find that Python is the easiest programming language to learn and it's one that is most representative of the other programming languages. Um, I have a whole nother video on what programming language should you learn first, and the TLDR for that is Python, R, and Bash. Um, I recommend that you do Python first because it is easier to learn. And if you do R first, then you'll have a harder time translating the concept into other languages, whereas doing Python first, you'll at least understand uh, the basic structure of variables, conditional statements, loops, etc. And that will still apply when you go into R and even into Bash. Although in Bash, you don't use these things as much because we don't tend to write as many scripts. We do more of like the one liners. Um, so when you're learning Python, I suggest that you just check out the tutorials online. There are tons of these. They're all different and they change all the time. So I'm not going to make a single recommendation, but just look around for Python tutorial and see which one kind of helps you learn some of these basic things um, in a way that suits your learning style. The other thing I'd say for learning Python is try to use Colab. I really like Colab. They are just like IPython and Jupyter Notebooks, um, but they are hosted for you. They are free to use um, and they're just really fantastic. So I really love doing this. It's a great way to for you to write down what you have done. And it's especially, it's great both for learning, like you can take someone else's Colab Notebook and work on it and you know, run their code and tweak it and try to understand um, how it works. So it's really great for that. And it's also really great for when you're actually doing your research because you can load in some data at the beginning, make some plots and kind of explore and you have a log of everything that you did a little bit like a lab notebook. Um, and this can be really handy for showing off your work to other people later. So I highly recommend that you use some kind of um, Jupyter notebook or Colab, which is kind of a nice free online version of the Jupyter notebook. All right. The second step that I would say is do some courses that are related to the kind of work that you want to do. I'll make one specific recommendation here, uh, which is that Ben Langmead has some nice videos on his YouTube channel um, from a course that he did, I think on Coursera and possibly also at Johns Hopkins, where he is a professor um, called Algorithms for DNA Sequencing. This is a really great course. He goes into a lot of the concepts from next generation sequencing, all the different kinds of genomics files that we work with and how aligners work and all of that great stuff, um, which is really great because I don't want to get into all of these details right now. I think Ben Langmead explains it really well. So I'll just link to his work and that way you can go over there and you can check that out. So I'll put links to all of these 
uh, where you can find them either around this video or in the description. Um, and if you have other recommendations that you want to share with other people who are watching this video, be sure to leave a comment under the video and then other people can find it. That way, if there are new things that come up, we can kind of gather a nice little uh, collection of all these great courses that are out online. The third thing I want to recommend is that you brush up on statistics. Um, for the basics on this, like what is a p-value and how do I do a t-test and what does this mean, uh, Khan Academy is really great. They've really nailed these basics. It's super easy to understand, or at least they explain it in the easiest possible way to understand, which is the best you can expect. Um, so I really like what Khan Academy did there. Um, if you are going to be publishing papers with p-values in them, like let's say that you run a GWAS or something, and you're going to report those p-values, definitely make sure that you understand the underlying statistics. My thesis had barely any p-values in it. I'm not even sure it had a single one because I was doing more computer science -y visualization type stuff. So I didn't make a lot of statistical claims of significance or anything like this. But if you do that in your work, you absolutely have to make sure that you not just brush up on the basics of statistics, but that you also know the specific statistical tests that you are using and when they apply and the kinds of things that you could have done to mess that up. An example is if you run a script that does 100 GWASs, and then you still just report the p-values from the original GWAS as if they still hold true, which they don't after multiple hypothesis test correction. And that's something that you'll know if you actually go and look into this research. That's just an example, um, but there are many pitfalls in statistics and you really want to be sure that when you're reporting p-values to people that it actually is correct. It's very important. No p-hacking. Look up what that is if you don't know it. Be sure not to do p-hacking. Don't lie with statistics. Um, look up all of these things, especially if you're doing statistics in your work. I really don't want to see um, any of this bad science coming up just because you don't look up the basics. So this is really important. All right, the fourth thing I want to recommend is that you get really comfortable on the command line. Um, this is the language that I sometimes call bash um, or shell or even say like open up your terminal and do x. This is the command line. The command line is where you run many bioinformatics tools from. Uh, so if you're not comfortable using it, then it's going to be really hard for you to do most of the bioinformatics work that you want to do. Um, an example of doing things on the command line is if you want to use SAM tools or BED tools, you want to run any aligners, any variant callers, or even just inspect your data. To get started with the command line, I have a couple of videos that I think are really good for getting you started. There's a lot more things that I might cover on that in the future if I have time in my busy life uh, to make additional videos, which is fun. Um, but there's also a lot of other great lists of one-liners and um, interesting combinations of piping different tools together in Bash uh, using the various utilities that are available to us there. And these are really fun. They're fairly easy. Once you figure it out, you can kind of keep applying it again and again. Um, and it's just like a nice thing to have in your tool belt. So the fifth step is just do bioinformatics, which is completely different depending on where you are in your career, what you have access to right now. As a general rule, I would say that it is good to find someone to work with, like a professor at a university um, who can act, who's actually doing this kind of research that you can work with so that you can learn from them. If that's not available to you, and if you have to do everything on your own, then like hard mode, very much hard mode. If I, if I had to do this myself and like starting over had no experience, no nothing, and had just followed the first four steps and wanted to like become a bioinformatician without any uh, universities, courses, professors, degree programs that I can plug into, 
without all of that, what I would do is start reading papers. Um, just like go on the bioarchive and pick out papers that are interesting to you. I say the bioarchive because it's a preprint server and it's free, so you can read all the papers even if they haven't gotten published yet, which means that you're more on the frontier of research that's just been finished. Read a lot of papers, see what you're interested in, find a question that you want to answer. And that is how we do science, right? We find a question we want to answer, we figure out what experiments do we need or what data do we need to find somewhere to help us answer that question and then we just try to do it. Now that sounds really hard, that's essentially like the work of a PhD student and one that does not have much support from a mentor, so that's really really hard. Um, I had to do this kind of studying for a qualifying exam in grad school and I found it surprisingly um, helpful for teaching me just how much I can actually understand a field from reading its papers in a lot of detail. And at first it seemed boring, but the more I got into it, the more I really started to see that, oh, these two papers are contradicting each other, but maybe their results both make sense if you think of it this way and oh they weren't measuring this but they were measuring this and so maybe there's a disconnect between how they're actually measuring it and that's why they seem to contradict each other but i can imagine a world in which both of those are correct and both of their results make sense and here's the experiment that i would do to resolve that conflict like that's really cool like that that's science right there if you can read papers and get to that point where you're kind of figuring out how to resolve the questions that are still left in a field, um, that's really great. Now you may not have the resources to do all of that, uh, to actually do the experiments, but if you can do that kind of scientific thinking, that's a really big part of it. Now the other thing that I would recommend, um, that's a little easier than that, is find one paper that you think is cool and where the data is available and reproduce the results. Code up the analysis yourself, reproduce the results that the paper had using the same data or similar data if you can find it. This is not always going to be easy. Most papers are not necessarily going to have all of their data available to you and usually not in very easy to find or easy to work with ways, but that is a really big part of bioinformatics is cleaning data and finding the data in the first place that's available that you can actually use. This is always going to be an issue and if you learn to deal with that that's like a major thing that also you have to honestly relearn again and again because every data set is different and they all have their own beautiful magical issues with them that we get to try to resolve and clean up. Um, so that's a good way to learn. Um, if you have any recommendations, any of you watching this, um, for any papers that you thought did some cool stuff and where the data is available, please do leave a comment below this video and let people know because that way we have a few of these kinds of papers that people can be like, oh, I can reproduce this one as an exercise. That can be really helpful. Um, but of course, do the first four things first. Um, so that you can actually, you know, get to a point where you're a little bit more comfortable working with data and um, have learned some things about genomics and so on. If genomics is the field that you want to read more into. Now the good news is if you're already a biologist and you already have some research going, then there are probably already times when you're making plots of some data that you gathered. Even if it's fairly small data, even if you're not doing like high throughput next generation sequencing stuff, you will always have some data. And one of the first things you can do is to start like trying to plot that data in Python instead of in Excel. And that's good practice. So that's like a place to start. I think that's all I wanted to say for today. Um, let me know if this video was helpful to you. I am trying to convince myself to fit more of this video making into my schedule because I feel bad that I've barely posted anything in like two years now. 
Um, and that's because I used to do this as a full-time business for like six months. And then I got a real job and started, you know, um, only doing bioinformatics at work and not in my free time. And so I haven't been making any of these videos. And I do feel bad about that because I get all these great comments from you guys that that make me feel really good, but also makes me feel bad because I have been neglecting it. So do let me know if this was helpful and maybe you can all kind of peer pressure me into making more videos. Um, and yeah, keep asking good questions. I will try to do a better job of answering them um, with videos as well. Um, although I mostly answer the questions in the comments when it's something that I feel like I have an answer to. So I try, I really do. Um, but yeah, if you have any good questions, I can try to make videos on those too. Um, it's a hard world out there right now. With COVID, that's something that we can solve with science. Um, everything else, social justice, it's very hard to solve. Um, we cannot necessarily solve that with science. We can partially solve it with data. There are programs like Campaign Zero that essentially clean up data for us and expose it to the public in nice readable ways. So that's another way that you can kind of think about, you know, bioinformatics is to biology just like what data science is to everything. So the skills that you learn here can be used on all of these other issues as well. And, you know, as long as you end up applying your skills to something that you can at least draw an indirect line and say, this kind of helps the world. Like this is spreading information about the truth, whether that's in science or in the social sciences. That's great. Um, and I hope that all of you guys out there are using your skills for good. So yeah, that was a long rant, but <sighs> let me know what you think. I always do care. Um, so thank you so much. <laughs>